Welcome back into Sports Memo's betting podcast. We got college football, every game on the board with our next guest, Robbie Vino. Rob, welcome to the pod. How are you? I am good tonight, Drew. How are you? I'm good, man. We're uh, starting off here. Rotation number 359-360, Arizona State, Oregon State in the Pac-12. We got uh, ASU minus three on the highway, 57 the total. Yeah, good game, Drew. Um, Obviously, Oregon State shut down last week by Washington, a game where, you know, Oregon State didn't score a single offensive point. One touchdown in the game, and that touchdown was an interception return for touchdown. And that's a team, Oregon State, that had come in averaging 33 points a game. So certainly they're going to want to get back on track here against Arizona State. Uh, For State, it looks like Jaden Daniels, their starting quarterback, will be back. Uh, Joey Yeldon did a pretty good job in relief last week, 28-44, 292. Four touchdowns against USC in that contest Um, but it looks like Daniels will go so you get the dual threat quarterback back here I think for Arizona State and the reason why Oregon State will probably find offensive success here Drew is that when you start breaking down Arizona State's schedule that really good defensive start to the season that they had looks more and more like it was a product of the schedule itself week one Kent State Week two, Sacramento State. Week three, Michigan State. And then week five, California. Those four teams not known for offense. And ASU did a great job, only allowed nine and a half points per game. But every other game, aside from that, five Pac-12 games, they're giving up 32 and a half points per game. That's an increase of 23, of 451 yards a game. We know Oregon State's got a potent offense. They could take advantage of that. I could see a little bit of back and forth here from both of these offenses uh, in this game because as the season's going on, Herm Edwards has had to go away from his, um, you know, initial philosophy of ground and pound style of offense. And they've thrown it around a little more, and they've been pretty successful. So I was a little bit surprised that the total went down here. We see a drop to 57. To me, that's a little too low. Um, I'm going to look into this and maybe get on the over in this game. Uh, wouldn't surprise me either if Oregon State – was to come up a winner in this one. You have to check for bowl eligibility possibilities of teams at this time of year. And Arizona State, with a win, would qualify for a bowl. OSU needs two more wins. uh, And their last two games are difficult. They have Washington State and Oregon to end the season. So um, both teams obviously will come fully focused. But I think points are going to be the word of the day here in this game. I think over 57, probably the right way to go. And no bad weather in Corvallis. Usually you have to worry about the rain and that nastiness, but um, looks like it's going to be a nice night uh, for that game. We got uh, another Pac-12 game here. USC at California. Seeing uh, minus six in the hook. That's the Trojans laying in Berkeley. 48 the total here, Robbie. Yeah, and Cal becomes bowl eligible with a win here. Big win for them last week. A referee apology game, of course, apologizing to Mike Leach in Washington State for a wrong call where a penalty was enforced against Washington State that was really on California and backed them all the way up to their own eight-yard line. And Washington State, I think, drove about 70 yards, ended up with a field goal. But the fact is, you know, the apology came and they should have had the ball at midfield to start that drive so obviously suspension for that referee uh he's not going to be able to ref for a couple of games here made a pretty bad mistake 30 yards worth i think for california fundamentally drew it's the second week in a row they're going to see an air raid offense they saw washington state last week um win that game like i say 33 20 now they'll see usc's version of the air raid and they're totally different styles uh washington state doesn't really attempt to run the football Last week, Anthony Gordon, 45 of 58, 407 yards. Cal didn't really stop their passing attack. But USC, um, with all their receivers, does run the football. So this will be a little bit different version here. <clears throat> I think California offensively, big break last week when Devin Monster came back to play quarterback. Um, certainly, it helped their offensive production, 426 total yards in that game. And there's a sizable defensive edge to the Golden Bears in this contest, obviously. They're the better defensive team. USC still struggling with injuries on that side of the ball. I think if you're a totals better, you have to be aware of Cal being 1-8 and 
under the total so far this season. And last week was the first time <clears throat> that they had a game total go over 48 points. It's significant here because the total is 48. So Cal's only had one game all year long, and that was last week against WSU where the game went over 48 points. So totals betters keep that in mind. Um, last week was the first time for the Cal Golden Bears in five home games that they were a home underdog. The previous four, they were home favorites. Last week, they're a home dog. They get a straight-up win. Uh, their record as a home favorite, not good. But they're a home dog again, Drew. I think six and a half is a little too much here. USC could win the game. Uh, but I don't know that they're going to win by more than six and a half against a California team fighting for bowl eligibility in this one and with the better defense of the two. And to finish off the three pack to start off this section, Robbie, staying in the pack 12, we got Arizona at Oregon. Ducks laying 27 at home, 68 and a half the total here, Robbie. Well, we know they're going to score. And Arizona's defense is an absolute mess. They tried to fire Marcel Yates, uh, give. Chuck Cecil, the interim defensive coordinator tag, to see if that would make a difference. And heading into the bye, he had one game against Oregon State, and it didn't make a difference. Uh, Arizona lost that game 56-28. to Into the bye week they go with a chance to regroup and maybe figure out something defensively. But I don't know what they're going to figure out against Oregon, Drew, which right now is rolling on all cylinders offensively. The last time we saw them, before they had a bye, they were smashing USC. And the defense that we praised early on and then regressed a little bit against Washington and Washington State came back again against USC, only allowed 4.3 yards per play. So maybe Oregon uh, in a little bit better shape defensively here. I don't think they'll stop Arizona cold. Arizona's just too good offensively, averaging over 500 yards per game. And now, you know, Arizona's into this two-quarterback system where it's no longer just Khalil Tate. It's Khalil Tate and Grant Gunnell, the thrower of the two. And even with those two guys, they've been very, very productive offensively. Two games with the two-headed system, 495 total yards, 526 total yards. They can put up their share. That makes the 27 a little bit scary here to lay, if you're thinking about laying it with Oregon. Um Arizona's defense is so bad that this game could get out of touch within the first half, and therefore it's a little scary to take points with Arizona as well. We see some movement in the total in this game. I think there's a little bit of an exterior factor here. Not too much. I don't want to place too much emphasis on this, but there is a revenge factor for Oregon, who got slaughtered by Arizona last year, 44-15, to and a 29-point loss is not easily forgotten by a team like Oregon in a game that they were supposed to win. So uh, I think you've got a little bit of an edge there as well. Uh, you know, Oregon's going to win this game, Drew, whether or not they win by four touchdowns or not. A full four touchdowns is another question. But I do think that the way they're going right now, 49 points, not out of the realm of possibility, which makes the over in this case um, a pretty good look. I think last check I saw... 67, 67 and a half. If it's gone anywhere from there, um, I'm not sure. But I think at that price tag, you can still play over. This game should find its way into the low 70s. Heading to the fun belt, Robbie. We got Coastal Carolina at Arkansas State. Looks like uh, ASU laying 12 and a half in Jonesboro. 60 the total here, Robbie. Yeah, and a little bit of movement on Arizona, or excuse me, Arkansas State, ASU. Um, Maybe rightfully so. Maybe not, though, Drew, because defensively they've been a sieve all season long. And despite the fact that nine days ago on Thursday night we saw Coastal Carolina get absolutely overwhelmed by ULL, um, that game, the Coastal Carolina side scored a touchdown finally on their last possession of the game. And they wind up losing big to University of Louisiana Lafayette. Um They'll have an easier time offensively here, no matter who quarterbacks. Fred Payton, the starting quarterback for Coastal, came in and quarterbacked that final series of the game that led to the touchdown. Now, you know, before we get into quarterback controversies between Payton or Bryce Carpenter, it needs to be recognized that 
Peyton quarterback that drive against Lafayette backups. Uh, they had unloaded the bench at that time, both offensively and defensively. They were playing second and third teamers. It could be a combination of both QBs here. Could be Peyton, could be Carpenter. I think there's not much difference between the two. Carpenter might be a slightly better thrower. Um, but either way, they'll be more productive this week than they were last week because Arkansas State's defense just has so many holes that you can't help but score some points against them. The transition for Arkansas State's offense the last three weeks, I don't know why, because they had been throwing the ball very well all season long, even with the second-team quarterback, Lane Hatcher, who came in, I think, around game four of the season uh, when they lost their starter. But the last three games, they've decided to be a very, very run-heavy team. If you just take a look at their play call selection for the last three games, Arkansas State, three games ago against UL Lafayette, 59% run, 49, 41% pass. Texas State, 65.5% run. UL Monroe last week, 62% run. Um, it could be twofold. It could be that they don't think Lane Hatcher is as good at throwing the ball as they were with Logan Bonner. Or it could be that their defense is so bad that head coach Blake Anderson decided maybe we'll run the football a little more and create less possessions. But I'll tell you what, if you go check out the total plays in those three games where they've decided to be run heavy, there's still a boatload of plays being run in Arkansas State games. So I don't know if I would put any credence into the theory that he's trying to slow games down and lower possessions. The only reason I bring that up is because this total has gone down from 64 to 60. And when you try to make some reasoning out of why people would want to play under in this game, I think that's the first thing you notice. Arkansas State has become run heavy. Uh, That probably lowers the possessions and and lowers the final game score. Just not sure that it happens here. I will say this. UL Lafayette, in their game last week against Coastal, did not punt. They scored every time they had the ball, except the last time when the game ended with ULL on the two-yard line. If it was if there was one more play, they would have scored again. Um, they didn't punt, and that game didn't get over the total. Uh, so Arkansas State's not going to score every time they have the ball the way Lafayette did. 60 probably is at a good place right now, difficult to play. I think Coastal Carolina plus 12-and-a-half might be a good side, though, because I do believe they can score – Punch for punch with Arkansas State. Robbie, we got UTEP at UAB up next. Uh, 44 and a half being the total, 18 and a half, the Blazers laying in Legion Field. All right, so those people who watch us every week know that I got on my soapbox about UAB a couple of weeks ago, worst opponent schedule or worst opponent power rating in the country. They go to Tennessee, they get trashed. Uh, they come back last week against Southern Miss, they get beat 37 to 2. Some of that has to do with the fact that their quarterback, and believe me, where UAB is concerned, the gap between starting quarterback Tyler Johnston III and backup quarterback redshirt freshman Dylan Hopkins, it's a big difference. So having to use Hopkins last week can explain away some of the 37-2 to loss. Uh, he did have to come in, I believe, for about a quarter and a half in that Tennessee game as well. But it doesn't explain away everything, Drew. I just think UAB is not good. Uh, They built a nice-looking resume off of garbage opponents. And when they were faced with a couple of good teams, they couldn't handle either one of them. No how, no way. On the offensive side, on the defensive side, I don't want to take too much away from them because the defense has still held up. Um, It's not like Tennessee put up a ton of total yardage against UAB, and it's not like Southern Miss did either. Both teams were held in the low 300s total yardage-wise, so the defense has been there, but that offense is a mess, and there's no way in heck you could lay 18, or at least I couldn't lay 18 with this team right now, with Dylan Hopkins once again being your quarterback this week. It's already been announced that Tyler Johnston's out of this game, so you're going to get the backup, a guy that's produced nine points in two weeks, You're laying 18 against UTEP, and here's the other end of the coin, or the other side of the coin. You want to take UTEP, you kind of hold your nose with that, too. Although, a few weeks ago um, on this show, we talked about how uh, Kai Loxley and head coach Dana Dimmel thought that in their loss to Louisiana Tech, the only way they were stopped offensively was by themselves. 
They were their own worst enemy. They lost that game 42 to 21. That was the first game this season where UTEP decided to get out of their two-headed quarterback system and go solely to Kai Loxley. Scored 21 points. Came back the following week, scored 26 points against North Texas. Came back last week, scored 21 more against Charlotte, and actually had a first and goal on the three in the third quarter. Four cracks at it. They didn't get in. But the point is their offense has been a lot better uh, by UTEP standards the last three games. And if they can put up 13 points here, Drew, or 14 points, boy, 18 is a monster number. I don't see UAB getting to 31 or better against this team unless they do it with some help from their defense. Maybe the defense creates a touchdown or sets the offense up in point-blank range a couple of times. Um, So for me, I would be looking at plus 18 with UTEP in this game. I think they're still playing, believe it or not, a team that bad at this time of season. Still playing with some confidence, still playing with some energy, and uh, I think plus 18 is probably a little too much for UAB right now. Robbie, heading to the SEC next, we got South Carolina heading to Texas A&M. We got 11, the Aggies, Lane and College Station, 50 and a half being the total. Well, here's another team, and you know, it's funny, this time of year, Drew, when you get to like game 10, um, even for those of us who make power ratings, that we consider to be extremely accurate. It gets harder at this time of year because certain teams drift off so badly uh, one way or the other, so drastically one way or another. There is a better way to put it. Either a team is ascending at this time of year or a team is quitting on the season or the coaching staff is going to a uh, youth movement. And for whatever reason, teams tend to stray off of their power rating um, by a lot at this time of year. You can pick them out. And if you can pick them out, you can make a lot of money these last three weeks. I think one of these teams could be South Carolina. This is going to be a bad spot for them. Now, last week, they basically lost any chance they had of going to a bowl game when they lost to Appalachian State at home 20 to 15. Right now, they're a four and six team. They're playing A&M here. They have to finish with Clemson. They're probably not going to win both of these games. I think the season's done. In fact, this week you see a couple of articles where the president of South Carolina is backing Will Muschamp because those rumors or that noise is getting louder and louder. A lot of people, you know, have been calling for Muschamp's head for a while. Really? That loss last week didn't help things any whatsoever. Um, there's been a little bit of disagreement. You know, there was a new AD hired at South Carolina to start the season. The two didn't get along very well. Um, it was kind of a prove it year for Will Muschamp. And at the beginning of the season, he told anybody who would listen that this was the most talented squad he's had. Now, injuries are certainly not the fault of the head coach and they've got injuries on top of injuries on top of injuries. Um, last week they had to play two walk-ons at wide receiver. So the wide receiving core is an absolute mess for South Carolina right now. Now, Will Muschamp, in his press conference Monday, talked like a coach who intends on being back next year, who intends on being in this for the long haul, although some would say he's already been in it for the long haul and it's time for him to go. Um, They've made the decision, executive decision, so to speak, that they're going to pull all freshmen who might have their red shirts burnt. Guys who have played four games will not see the field anymore this year. Um, Veteran players who were injured and have seen four games or less will not see the field this year. They're just going to go with what they have. And to me, that just indicates a, uh, you know, a, a desire to look toward next year. Not a good spot to be in when you're going to College Station. Texas A&M had a bye week last week. They haven't been great this year, but they did put up 94 points the last two weeks before the bye. Jimbo Fisher seems to have the offense rolling a little bit better. And I think in this case, they're going to get a South Carolina team that's so banged up, that's pretty youthful, that uh, is kind of patchwork together at this point in time with no big playability. And I think all that adds up to an A&M blowout. You know, a and is going to have to close this season with at Georgia 
and home to LSU. I don't know anybody who wants to play those two games the last two games of the year, but they have to. So a win here would be big for a 6-3 and three team. I think A&M gets it. Um, I'm going to be against South Carolina these last two games of the year. All right, Rob, we've got a few games left. We'll steam through them here. Georgia at Auburn, oldest rivalry in the South. Bulldogs 2.5 and, and Jordan Hare 41 the total, Robbie. You know, I think before I read a couple articles today, Drew, <clears throat> I was going to try and build the case that the offensive line injuries that Georgia suffered last week in that game against Missouri were three offensive linemen left the 